I'd just like to start by thanking, thank you, Rabbi Shaiwitz, Rabbi Stasky, thank you all of you uh, for inviting me uh, and uh, sharing a little bit of my insights and what I found in Shemitah, as I just expressed to Rabbi Albo, I developed all these different programs on Shemitah, basically because I feel strongly it's extremely important for people chutzaretz to be able to identify, uh, to identify with the mitzvah. And uh, hopefully through my presentation, I'll try not to be too repetitive of what you have already heard in the first hour and try to bring some new, new things into, into it. But invariably, the piece of repetition, uh, please do interrupt me at any time. I do not look at the chats as I'm presenting. So if you want to interrupt, just interrupt. Go for it. Okay. Uh, and the good thing for me to do is to share sounds, which would be a wonderful thing to do. We should participate in Israeli style. I'll just cut you off. That's right. That's right. Okay. Just uh, as a matter of uh, reference, this particular sign is one that you see as you're driving around here in Eretz Israel from time to time. When you do fair, uh, pass a field where they are keeping Shemitah, Pshutok, Mashma'ah. No heads of Mechira, no Otsar Bedin, Gankan Shomrin Shemitah. In the theory, you could pull your car up to the side of the road, see what's planting there. If you're hungry for something, take it, eat it. And as we said before, that's a mitzvah of, uh, of Shemitah. And what's fascinating about Shemitah is this is Rav Mati Shomron. Rav Mati, and I think it's an important point for kids to realize and for adults as well. Rav Mati Shomron works in Machon Atzorav Aretz, which deals with a lot of the mitzvot at Tliyab Aretz. He makes an extremely important point. יום אחד באחד ההרצאות שנתתי, בסוף ההרצאה ניגשת אליי איזו אישה, כנראה מתפוצת פולין או משהו, לא צעירה, ואומרת לי, תשמע, אני רוצה להגיד לך דבר אחד. הרבנים שלנו אצלנו, התכוונה כנראה לפולין, היה להם זקן יותר ארוך מכל הרבנים שלכם פה, ואף אחד לא הפריש תרומות ומעשרות. ואני אומרת לך, זו המצאה שלכם פה בישראל. אתם המצאתם את זה. מה טמון פה בעצם? שאנחנו נמצאים אחרי כמעט אלפיים שנות גלות, והנושא של קיום מצוות התלויות בארץ, מי דיבר עליו בכלל? מי עסק בו בכלל? כיוון שזה לא היה משהו קיומי, אז זה נדחק לקרן זווית. ברוך השם שיש את הרמב״ם שכתב את המצוות הללו, אחרת אוי ואבוי איפה היינו נמצאים היום. דבר שלא נהגו אותו קרוב לאלפיים שנה, אז ברור שלא לא היה שום יחס לדברים האלה ב- ב- אצל הציבור הרחב. כל... כלה צעירה בישראל ידעה איך מכשירים עוף, ואיך צריך להכשיר את הכבד, ומה לעשות בכל מצב שכלי נטרף או כל דבר שקשור לכשרות הבית. אבל מי, דב, מי בכלל דיבר על הפרשת תרומות ומסרות? מי בכלל דיבר על תחום מצוות פניות בארץ? אף אחד לא עסק בזה, אף אחד לא דיבר בזה. ברוך השם, היום אחרי אלפיים שנה, אנחנו מחדשים את כל ה... לא רק אנחנו, יש עוד הרבה יהודים טובים בארץ שעושים את זה. מחדשים את כל ההתעסקות עם הנושא הזה, מנסים לרדת לעומק, להבין את כל הדברים, לכתוב מאמרים, ללבן את הסוגיות, ללמוד מה קורה בכל צמח, על איזה תנאים הוא עונה, על איזה תנאים הוא לא עונה, כדי שבאמת בסופו של דבר לציבור יהיה מענה מסודר, מעמיק ואמיתי של כל אחת מן המצוות התלויות בארץ. So the first point, very, very much, how lucky we are. ברוך השם, that we're sitting here on a Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, in discussing Shemitah and Eretz Yisrael. For literally hundreds and hundreds of years, this, this subject was totally, totally off the table. If you started a conversation about it, you're probably put in some corner someplace. And, and that we have the schut that we're discussing this. And that's something which is extremely, extremely important for people to realize, for our kids to realize. They're very used to having Eretz Yisrael. I'm older than you. So I remember pre-1967. I don't remember pre-1948. And it's a schut to be able to discuss the mitzvah of, of Shemitah at this time. And the other discussion very, very much and is the development of halacha. In other words, in Shabbat, every rav and every shtat wrote a tshuva about Hilchot Shabbat through the years as different situations arose. And Hilchot Kiddushin, Hilchot Kitin, you have a whole pile of tshuva after tshuva after tshuva coming up into, in, into modernity. Uh, when it comes to Shemitah, there's a big black hole where it really wasn't discussed or hardly discussed. You, you, you have to do a very uh, thorough search to find the different uh, uh, tshuvot about, about Shemitah. They do exist here and there. And so the discussion, uh, we're new at this. 
we're very, very new at this. And the fact that there are so many different opinions out there, uh, which exists by other things as well, but the, the normative halacha has not really come into play yet because this is a very new thing, especially in the modern economy of, uh, of Medinat Israel. And Baruch Hashem, like I said, that we're having this discussion today, it's, it's, a real, it's a real, real privilege. So what I always try to present, and you and Rabbi Stavsky uh, drove the um, conversation uh, between Shabbat and between Shemitah, and that is HaKadosh Baruch Hu created a beautiful world, no matter where you are, with beautiful American fruits, Bari Prayetz, Bari Adama, etc., etc. et cetera. And if Shabbat has to be observed, no matter where you are, in China, Chile, or any place else around the world, what is it about these tomatoes and these cucumbers and these carrots and these peppers that all of a sudden Shemitah is limited, is limited to, um, to Eretz Yisrael? And it may be an obvious question, uh, but it's something that has to be discussed. And this, I think, this particular slide puts the Mitzah Shemitah into, into some sort of framework uh, for our students, which I think is very, very important. It's not the sore thumb mitzvah that's out there. Shemitah very much is a reflection of Kedushat Eretz Yisrael. And at the end of the day, if after all the details of Shemitah and everything else are long forgotten, I think that the essence of what we need to go ahead and we need to communicate uh, to Dor Haba for the next generation is the centrality of Eretz Yisrael to the Jewish experience. Uh, there's something, again, the, the when I present this, I sort of take the cucumber in my hands and I say this cucumber has a secret ingredient. There's the kedusha that's present in the cucumber. There's the kedusha that's present, that's, present, that's present in the pepper. And this kedusha, again, is something which they're familiar with. It shouldn't be all of a sudden we have something called kedusha. Because as you see, they're used to all sorts of different types of, uh, all sorts of different types of kedusha that encircle and circle our lives. Uh, Kedusha, in its essence, is the way we grow, come close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And the idea of Kedusha Tamakom, whether it's the Beit Knesset, which of course is an outgrowth of the Kedusha at the Beit HaMikdash, is the Mikdash Ma'at, or the Kedusha at Eretz Yisrael, which is really, really, really felt very, very strongly by those who observe it during Shemitah. And when I say what's important for people in Chutz Haaretz, that's it. Again, what, uh, again, the other, uh, you know, what uh, we're going to go through what I do in the supermarket. Now, that is of lesser importance. And their takeaway should be wow, Eretz Yisrael has such kedusha that even the cucumber is holy. And that's something which I think is, is extremely, extremely important, especially for people who live chutzaretz and don't have this. And for those that, you know, we come here all the time and, you know, Eretz Yisrael has become a place with the good restaurants. You know, go to Amak right near Amak or Amak Katsamon, and you go you go to the restaurants in Amak, and they go take the good seal and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And this idea of kedushat Eretz Yisrael, which is really felt very, very much during Shemitah. Uh, the question: What about the other years? And this may not enter into your conversation, but it enters into mine. Is not this just a once in seven year tofa'ah? And of course, the answer is not is that we do have Trumot Masraut. Uh, and I do try, to, but Trumot Masraut in my life is, and again, those of you who have visited Eretz Yisrael or even have lived here for a certain period of time or came to study Shana uh, Ba'aretz or Shana Tayim or whatever, it's very doubtful whether you had occasion to actually take off Trumot Masraut. And the reason is that this label uh, that exists on uh, this bag of carrots, so for sure, Chumotu Masro Kedin. So, in, uh, I guess it goes uh, comparable to Melicha. Um, again, my, my, my mother even used to salt the, the chicken at home. I remember doing, we used to have the kosher, kosher salt, and then the kosher salt was relegated in the wintertime to spreading it on the ice because the kosher salt was very good at melting the ice also. But in its original state, do you still sell that diamond kosher salt? They still said they used to. They still sell it. The kashering salt. Uh, so and again, the chumotim asrot are not necessarily done at all by a balabas. Uh, Ninety-nine percent of the things that you buy, I don't want to get into. If you stop at one of the roadside stands and buy from uh, from from an Arab, that's all not the story. But who pushed chumotim asrot kizin? I'm lucky enough to own a kumquat tree, 
and I do have an, an annual kumquat uh, harvest, which takes place uh, usually in January. This is Chavtepetevet of Tashem Bay. And so I have the unique privilege of every year of going ahead and being mafrish chumotu ma'asrat and saying the bracha mafrish chumotu ma'asrat. Uh, but that's not something which is necessarily felt by people here in Israel at all. I'd say the average Israeli probably doesn't even know that Shemot and Masrat are taken. Uh, the history of, 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 of Shemitah, I think, is also something which is very integral. Uh, Rabbi Shai was mentioned, the famous Kamara, uh, of course, which builds on the Tochacha, the Chukotai. There's a direct result of uh, lack of keeping the Shemitah is Golot. And that's why you have a number of different interesting things during the times of Bayit Sheni, which uh, could be of interest. First is the Amana of Nehemia in Perak Yud, Pasuk Lamibet. We are, you all well aware of the Matzav Haruchani in, uh, in, in Bayit Sheni, especially at, at the beginning. And he stresses two things, which is interesting in terms of the, the, the symbiotic relationship, but he stresses Shabbat. And he also stressed, uh, stretches, uh, excuse me, stresses Shemitah. <coughs> so we see that the Nehemia sort of like got the memo that in Bayit Bishon, that was a failing somewhere along the line, the proper keeping of Shemitah. So he felt that keeping the Shabbat and keeping the Shemitah uh, were important. You have a reference to, to Shemitah and Sefer, and Sefer HaMakabim. Uh, so that takes us into the Hashmonet period. You have a reference to Shemitah and Josephus as well which takes us more towards the end of the Bayat, of the Bayat Sheni. So we don't, again, we don't know how many people were keeping Shemitah, but certainly there are interesting references that uh, at least during the times of Bayat Sheni, uh, people, there was certainly a kihila, there was certainly a group of Jews uh, that, were, that were adhering to the Mitzvah of Shemitah. Uh, as I said before, uh, if you look beyond Bayat Sheni, and you know, so there are some discussions, certainly in the Mishnah, extensive, uh, but in the Gemara, uh, you don't find much about Shemitah, but something interesting uh, is in the Shalah. And this appears in, he came to Yushalayim in 1622. Now there were Bodedim that came to Eretz Yisrael. The vast majority of the Bodedim were Plitim of the Inquisition and not necessarily the Eastern European Jew. The Shalah comes, and he comes to a year Shemitah. And uh, here already, interestingly enough, is when the Hetzer Mechira already start to get some traction. Uh, the the, the, uh, the Sfaradim already in the 1600s came up with this idea of Hetzer Mechira. It wasn't, it's not a recent invention. Uh, the Shalah is very reluctant to engage. And he says, I'm coming, coming to Eretz Israel after all these years. And I shouldn't keep Shemitah. Why did you come here if you're not going to give Shemitah? So it's a challenge. The challenge was come back to our land after so many, so many years. And there's certainly a shi'ifa, there's certainly a desire to go ahead and to keep Shemitah. Another fascinating subject, which I guess would, uh, I find it interesting to talk about. How do we, because we had this long lull, how do we even know when Shemitah is? Uh, because, the, for again, no one was keeping track. Nobody was here to keep track. The Jews, Chutz Aretz, were not dating their Shtarot or anything in the years of Shemitah. Uh, there are a variety of Machlokasim of the Gemara about the relationship of Shemitah and Yovel. But one fascinating thing, you take this year, uh, 5782, and you divide it by seven, the remainder is zero. And this is just a great mnemonic device. Obviously, it has no bearing halachically because Shemitah didn't start with Adam Rishon, and therefore Briata Olam uh, is, is irrelevant to this particular Hashbon, but it's still a fascinating, a happen chance, serendipity, call it what you want, uh, or, or Hashkacha, that this is a good way of figuring out that this year is Shemitah. Uh, but we do know that the first Shemitah actually took place uh, after the Zion uh, Shanim of Kibush, Zion Shanim of Chiluk, Eretz Yisrael. So it comes into 21 years after Yoshua crosses the Arden is when you have the first Shemitah. So it remains a little bit of a mystery of when Shemitah is. So um, the Gemara does have a bookmark for it, which is very helpful. The Gemara in Ta'anit, has a book has a bookmark 
and tells us that the, the Chorban Bayit Rishon and Chorban Bayit Sheni was on Motzei Shviat. It was on the first year of the next Shemitah cycle. <clears throat> and here you have an interesting nexus between Jewish history and Halakha. Uh, those of you who are a little bit more into Jewish history will not necessarily agree that the Chorban Bayit Sheni is 3830. Simplicity's sake, this is the more or less consensus date, even though there are many different opinions, which would make Shnat Tashmita 3829, 1,953 years ago. Take 1,953, divide it by seven, and the remainder is zero. And uh, so that has that is the way that we figure out our Shnat Shmita. Uh, of course, there is a discussion, and anybody that's teaching an advanced math class and wants to go to Chod Shmita V'yovel Perek Asiri, uh, the Rambam goes into a lengthy, lengthy mathematical computation of uh, when Shemitah is, but an amazing, amazing, amazing uh, lesson for all of us, because he comes up in Allah Vav, and he says, That was the Rambam's cheshbon. Uh, he had a certain reading of the Gemara. Uh, but if you look in Allah Chachet, he mentions that everybody disagrees with me. Now, those of us who are familiar with the Rambam, that never stopped him before, that everybody disagrees with him. He's very, uh, very, very brave to, to, to state his opinions. But over here, he just says in the last sentence, which is an extremely important sentence. And if everybody's saying that uh, this Shana is not Shemitah, but it's Mosei Shviat, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna tip my hat to them, and I'm gonna go along with it, and I'm going to accept your cheshbon, uh, even though historically there were certain people that came and said we should have a sefer deshmita, but they were they were summarily summarily dismissed, and therefore we haven't agreed upon a shnat a shnat shmita. Okay, uh, how does it work here in Israel? And again, you heard all the the various malchot uh, uh, that that uh, that are served for the farmers. Uh, is one very uh, one very important thing that uh, Rabbi Stavsky and Rabbi Shaiwitz didn't say. Uh, Rabbi Shaiwitz talked about the mitzvah to eat, and again, when you talk to people, and I've delivered this to Balabatim and shuls, and you ask, "What am I allowed? Am I allowed to eat during Shmita? No, 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 no. That's a visceral response that people sort of had. And as uh, Rabbi Shaiwitz said, that according to the Ramban, it's a mitzvah to eat. Akadekach, there's one of the mafarshim say you should make a bracha. Every time you eat a priya shemitah, the alachila perot perot shemitah, and that all fruit that grows during shemitah is mutar mutar la achila uh, with the kedushat with the kedushat shviat. But there is an isur, and this is an important. And from this isur is nove a lot of other things, and that's what's called svichin. And svichim are things that grow on their own during shemitah, uh, which the chazal said we're not going to allow it. Uh, because people will then grow vegetables on their own and claim that they're sfichin. If vegetables were planted illegally, in other words, if somebody today on Yochet Mar Cheshvan would go to their fields and would plant, and would plant something, that, uh, that is asur ba'achila. Uh, so there's an interesting difference, of course, between vegetables and fruits, uh, because fruits, you can't go in your backyard today and plant a tree and get fruits this coming Nisan. That's not going to work. I can go to my backyard now and plant uh, carrots and plant, plant celery and plant lettuce, and that will come out uh, in another couple of months. Uh, so therefore, when it comes to fruit, there is no isur because no one can plant it during Shemitah. So if I get a peach it come next May, I'm allowed to eat it, even though it grew during Shemitah, but no one planted the tree during Shemitah. It would be orla and be just impossible. Um, Svichim, which are vegetables, I have a totally, totally different halacha. And it's from here that a lot of the various, uh, uh, I'm going to say, minhagim of Shemitah, of terms of how people teach Shemitah, revolves around this particular Isur of Svichim. Um, but again, how does it affect me? Now, I'm not a farmer. I'm not going ahead and I'm not planting anything. Uh, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm not farming anything. I have my kumquats, it's a tree, I'm not planting it. Uh, but when I, I realized, uh, not the first Shemitah that you had, the second Shemitah that I hear, that it affects me very, very much because I have a garden. This is a guy, Dan Gordon, who's a gardener in Yushalayim. And you have to understand 
uh, that before, before Rosh Hashanah here this year, the person most in demand to come to your house, everybody wanted the gardener. You know, I guess, you know, before Pesach, you want the cleaning lady. And before, uh, you know, other holidays, you have these certain things that you need. Every, every, you couldn't get your gardener to come because you're so busy because it does affect gardening very, very much of what you're allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do. In my occupation, there is inherent within it something called Shabbos. I, I get a day, a year of rest, like the Shabbos of the week. I have the Shabbos of the year, so I get a, a year of rest. So there are certain things that I'm able to do, with certain things I cannot do in the garden during the Shemitah year. Uh, and of course, you know, with all the nice things that come with the Shabbos, spend more time with the kids and, uh, and, and with the family, and then spend more time uh, learning Torah. Shemitah is called a Shabbos, and so with the Shabbos of the week, anyone who wants to enjoy and have Oinig Shabbos, there's a preparation for the Shabbos of the week. So too with Shemitah. There's a preparation for the Shemitah, which is the Shabbos of the years. The things that I have started to do in my gardens in order to prepare for this Shabbos, the Shemitah of the years, is I've looked at areas of the garden where I rely on annual planting. Those are plants that will have to be reseeded or replanted every six months or every year because they grow and then they die completely and they do not regrow again the next year. And I look to see where those are in the garden and I decide if I want to replace that with something that does last from year to year. This special mitzvah that, as I've been learning about it now for quite some time, that I have the unique position to be so affected by it but to be so able to guard it at the same time. So I, I, I'm, 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 the closer we get to the Shemitah, the, there's, a, there's a tremendous excitement that's, that's swelling up inside of me. That it's like almost Shabbos. How excited we are for Shabbos. That's how I feel. Baruch Hashem. So this point of preparation is very, very important. Here in Eretz Israel, it takes a tremendous amount of preparation. Somebody mentioned that the government, there is government involvement, this gearing up for Shemitah a couple of years before Shemitah to make sure that uh, that the proper resources are available, et cetera, et cetera, not just in terms of staka, but in terms of all sorts of other things that have to be prepared before Shemitah. And I'll make that point a little bit more in, in a couple of minutes. Uh, so in the Gina, so we went ahead and my gardener did come and we planted and uh, with the hope of uh, that it should stay during, during Shemitah. And then the question is, what exactly am I allowed to do in the garden or not allowed to do in the garden? So you might be familiar. There are basically two categories, ukmiye and ivriye. So ukmiye are those things that I'm doing to sustain that which I have, which is totally mutar. Uh, and that extends to the farm as well. You're allowed to go ahead and to do things. You don't have to let just everything die, walk away from it and let everything die. You are certainly allowed to go ahead and allowed to water. You're allowed to mow your grass. You're allowed to trim it and to get down your path. It's not just a matter of just uh, everything growing wild. If Rouye is the things that you're uh, to improve that which you have. Uh, so you're not allowed to fertilize. Uh, you're not allowed to prune or to do other sorts of things which are going to improve that which is happening, and it's certainly you're not allowed. You're not allowed to plant. So that's uh, the gardening rules. Al al regal al regal uh, To me, this is the most important thing you can possibly communicate to your wonderful students in Ramaz. Uh, this is a uh, traffic circle near my house. Some of you may be familiar on Katzimon. This is where Rechov Kiskiyo and Eliezer Modi uh, meet. Uh, this I took this picture seven years ago. Um, you do know that here in Eretz Israel, we try to beautify the traffic circles and they plant flowers uh, so that should be uh, aesthetically aesthetically beautiful. Um, the city of Yushalayim keeps Shemitah. It's not just cone because I'm a you know, from person on Kini Shemitah. The city of Yushalayim keeps Shemitah. Many, many, many cities and, and Yishuvim across Eretz Israel keep, keep Shemitah. So this is what it looked like at the end of Shemitah, the same traffic circle. Kacha. And uh, because no new planting was done during the year, despite the watering, the flowers died off. So you make it look beautiful. 
And uh, this is this is the very, very same traffic circle. I should have taken it from the same vantage point. I'm not such a good photographer. But it is the same. It is very, very much the same traffic circle. The JNF keeps Shemitah. Now, the JNF, and this is the beauty of living in Midrat Yisrael, is that, and I, I mentioned this before, is that there's a feeling of Shemitah beyond your own Arba Amot of your house. It also exists in the street. It also exists as part of the Medina. The JNF keeps Shemitah. And therefore, this two bishvat, there's no nitiyat etzim from the from the J from the JNF at all. They have all sorts of other alternatives as to how uh, two bishvat two bishvat will be will be celebrated. And uh, it doesn't mean every city, it doesn't mean every chumrah is being observed. But there is certainly a feeling barachov a shmitah. As I said before, this is a type of mitzvah that speaks to a lot of different constituencies. Uh, beyond just the, the, the you know the that Haredi and that the Migzarim sectors, uh, there are a lot of people that care for the environment and they look at Shmita as the ultimate in terms of uh, in terms of environmental uh, sensitivity, and that's right. something which is which is if the state keeps the heter mechiru, why can't they plant on the sold traffic? Because, because the heter mechira is even on the state level. Not try. first of all, the things you can't do even with Hatem Mechira. Hatem Mechira, in its finest sense, doesn't mean you can do whatever you want. Hatem Mechira means non Jews can come and work in your fields and can go ahead and can do certain things. It doesn't mean it doesn't, it doesn't apply to, 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 to the, the forest at all. That land is not salt, it only applies in the Hetzers only for eating purposes, and so, so it's limited. Uh, one of the great, uh, as we get into it, when, when, when we talk about the Chazon Ish's uh, opinions about it, is that he said that the real Etzimichir has not been kept, is that the people signing off Etzimichir are just signing Etzimichir and doing what they want. And that's what Etzimichir is all about. There's still certain limitations in terms of Jews working, Jews should not be working the land uh, during, according to the strict uh, interpretation of Etzimichir, should be doing by non-Jews, et cetera, et cetera. So there are, there are, there are certain restrictions. Um, of course, the ultimate in the ultimate in keeping shmita is not just not working the land, and that is the farmer proclaiming get have care. Now, this is something again the, the tameim it's all why, but to do so is exceedingly exceedingly difficult. You can imagine not only am I being asked to go ahead and to not farm, is give up my parnasa for a year. I'm supposed to allow other people to go and just to take that which grows in my field. So here's a little photo, a little video clip I did with Yossi Peretz. Yossi Peretz is an etrog farmer. He has a uh, etrog uh, grove right near Beit Shemesh. He keeps Shemitah Shutok Mashmaal. And this is what he said about making his fields have care. הדבר הראשון, מה שאנחנו עושים זה רק משקים את השדה. שום דבר לא עושים. מטפלים בזה כל הזמן רק בהשקיה. עשו לנו גם לדשן, כי ההשגחות. השדה יש לו השגחה של הרב ניסים קרליץ, וגם של העדה החרדית, אבל אנחנו לא מדשנים. פשוט משקים. יש את העניין הזה של קיומה ולעברויה, אבל ממש רק כדי להחזיק את העצים, זה משקים במשך כל השנה. משאירים את הרשתות. כדי שזה ישמור על העצים קצת, אבל לא נוגעים בכלל בעצים במשך כל השנה. כשמגיעה שנת השמיטה, אנחנו שמים פה שלטים גדולים. בשלטים האלה כתוב שהשדה הפקר, אפשר לקטוף כל אחד לצורכו, לא למכירה, וגם אנחנו משאירים פה מזמרות כדי שלא יפגעו בעצים, כי חשוב לנו שיקטפו, אז כל אחד נכנס, לוקח מה שהוא צריך ויוצא. רק אנחנו משגיחים שבאמת לא ישחיתו ולא יפגעו לנו בעצים. זה מה שאנחנו עושים בשנת השמיטה, אבל הכל הפקר, מי שרוצה בא, נכנס, כותב ולוקח. ואני חושב שהעניין הזה של לקיים שמיטה בארץ ישראל, אפילו שזה כרגע מדי רבנן, אבל זה חשוב מאוד, זה גם מחזק את כולם ואת כולנו, וגם אנחנו מנסים לצרף עוד חקלאים שישמרו את עניין השמיטה. אבל אנחנו לא מודאגים, בורא עולם מפרנס אותנו. Uh, so I, I, I went, um, I went to his etrog. Sorry. Okay. I went to his etrog grove, and so anybody who's around here in Eretz Yisrael next summer, 
You can go together, you get a free hot drug. Uh, and uh, again, they do not grow as well when they're not tended to. Uh, that's just the nature of it. And uh, certainly, to a I was supposed about next year, everybody can have a field day next year with the Gim Chutz Laaretz, what you do and what you don't do when they come from Eretz Israel. That's a whole nother subject, which, you, which the kids will invariably ask, well, does it affect me? You know, and so, and, and there are certain, again, the, there are certain ways that it could very, very well affect somebody. This is not Yesi Peretz, is at Drow Grove. This is just a stock photo of an Adro Grove that was left to uh, grow during Shemitah and uh, have care. And it's for, it's for the coming. As I said before, at the outset, you do see these signs. I drove up to Herzliya last week along the road, especially along the, the fields of Kibbutz Shalavim. You do see these signs, Gankan Shomrim Shemitah, and there are fields just Shusokam Ashma'o, the left have care, the left, uh, the left just to grow during the year, and that certainly, certainly does happen. Uh, here's I have a question. I have a question. Um, in, uh, you know, from what you know, what are what's the percentage of farmers or that that actually keep shmita keep shuto? Meaning, in the sense that they don't use very low, very low because again, must, yeah, yeah, very low. Most farmers are not tati. In other words, this and they're not doing it, and uh, and so therefore, you're talking about just the dati sector, and not everybody in dati sector. So you're talking about the total number of farms. It's it's a rather low percentage of people that are keeping, you know, farms that are keeping shmita shuto kamashma. I would assume it's also Especially like smaller etro gim and wineries. Got it. There were a lot of the wineries they keep. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm assuming those who keep shmita. Those who keep shmita keep is more is less of the uh, those who are in the industry, the people who more have like a smaller a smaller field, or they have a few trees, or is is it more like family? Uh, not necessarily. Family. Not again. You have different people. You have different people that are into it. You have different mm. people that are into it, and uh, and um, you know, so it's hard to tell exactly who it is. Sometimes, sometimes you're surprised, but it's it's a small sector. Uh, so this is a sign that somebody like myself will put it outside during Shemitah. And again, it's I don't think this is really important to your students. Obviously, what you get to know here, right now we're involved in Shemitah for vegetables also. Those of you that are doing Dafyomi, this is what Dafyomi has been the last couple of days, all about this. Um, so he talked about, again, Yossi Paris talked about the people harming the trees. It was just in today's Daf. Uh, how people during Shemitah would harm the trees, and it was a problem that the the trees wouldn't recover for two or three years after Shemitah. Uh, so the on the on the fruits, it's only a fruits after two vishvat. That's a whole nother discussion. But you see somebody putting out a side of bashanah shvish tishpot haperot afker kedi sub brashot come to my backyard and take uh, take my uh, take my fruit because to hate. Okay, v'tich lechit zomru manachav bashanah shviyot. So the main problem here is what we're dealing with in Tough Shin Pei Bet in 2021. How does Shemitah fit into our modern economy? Uh, we can imagine maybe you're trying to buy a Cheney or a total agrarian economy, how uh, people could go, they can go out to their own yards and get food uh, on a daily basis. You're allowed to pick from your own yard that which you need for three meals worth. You're allowed to go to your neighbor's yard and we understand somehow how the Shemitah might have worked. But how does it work today? So um, Rab, Rabbi Shai was talked about, I think what he talked about, Eitzot, uh, the, the lingo here is Pitronot. That's the lingo, that's the lingo here is Pitronot. How, to, how Shemitah could possibly be observed? Obviously, Yavu Michul, Chutz uh, Aretz is a big piece of it, and a lot comes generally from Chutz Aretz, and certainly it's ramped up during, uh, during Shemitah, just things coming in and you're getting the potatoes from Poland and the grapes from Italy and the, and the, the whatever from Turkey. Uh, and that certainly is a easy pitaron. However, we are not helping the Israeli economy. We're helping the Polish economy, the Italian economy. And so there are people here that want to help the Israeli economy. So Chutz Aretz is certainly not a lechat uh, within the Megzar Haridi. This is what's done. Yevom Michol. Uh, that, that's the Nizar Kharizi. Uh, another possible source is in Yivul Nahri, is that there are Arab owned farms. We generally assume, even though it is a subject of uh, discussion, the accepted Psak is that Yesh Kinyan Lavdeko Khim Barit Sha'al Lafkiya Mideshbita, 
that if a non-Jew owns the farm, then it does not have the Kedushat Ta'aretz regarding Shemitah. Uh, in here, again, not to get into a political discussion, but you see the nexus of halacha and politics. Uh, because Yuvul Nachri, there's a very interesting discussion. Yuvul Nachri in some sectors, wow, this is great. We'll just buy from the Arabs, Hakol Tov. Uh, we'll, uh, you know, we won't have to deal with any of the restrictions, Svichin, Kedushat Shviyat, et cetera, et cetera. We'll get it from the Nachri. And there are other people who will not do this. Uh, based upon the political stand. How can you dare support the Arab sector? You have to go ahead and halakha cannot possibly demand this of us. And so you have the interesting nexus of politics and um, uh, uh, of politics and halakha. There's a, there's a very famous case, which is mentioned, but unfortunately a real case where there were different family members who couldn't eat at the same table uh, because uh, one, one refused to eat the Yavul Nachri and the other one refused to eat the Heta Mechira. And so the, there was, the family couldn't get together during Shemitah. And so that, that, that is a, a well-known, unfortunately, a, a, a real situation in some families. Now, what's fascinating here is you go shopping during Shemitah, you really have to know how to read your labels. Uh, you know, you go in, when you go into ShopRite or Farmers, wherever you happen to, you, you just pick up the vegetables and you just shove them in your cart and, and go Marno and Siamno. Uh, those of us who are sensitive to the, the Shemitah in and outs, uh, things are very well labeled. Uh, so over here, this is not a great picture, has a little bit of a wrinkle, but you may see this is Shemitah Tav Shem Pei Bet, Gidum Yuchad Yud Nun, which means Yuvon Nachre, which comes from a, a, an Arab-owned farm here in Eretz Israel. So, so for some people, that's a green light. Okay, I'm going to take it home. Other people, that's a red light. I don't want this in my house. Uh, depending on uh, exactly who you are and what you are and what your particular stance is. Um, yeah, let me just see. You don't need this. Yeah. Okay, the other picture note. A big one is you have simply your Um Again, everybody knows Shemitah is coming. Shemitah is not a surprise that all of a sudden, oh, it's a Shemitah year. So it takes a lot of planning in advance. Farmers can adjust and they do adjust their planting and harvesting schedule in the sixth year to try to get another cycle in uh, before Shemitah. And so with the Likita, with the, um, because when it comes to vegetables, you're doing tafiomi, you know this well, it's Petar Likita, that goes after the, when you are harvesting. And therefore this is a picture of a machsan, refrigerator machsan. Things can stay in cold storage for quite a long time. And so this is where we're up to right now. So a lot of stuff, in the shuk right now, in the right now, this time of year, we're still six, seven weeks after the beginning of Shemitah. And you see it's well marked, Yuvul Shishit. And this, according to er just about everybody. Now, uh, again, I don't want to say everybody. There's no such thing as everybody when it comes to Shemitah. There's always going to be a, another Shemitah someplace. But Yuvul Shishit right now, vegetables, is a great way of going ahead and, uh, and, and feeding the marketplace without any of the restrictions or whatnot uh, of Shemitah. And uh, now this is also very, very fascinating uh, as a pitaron, <laughs> very interesting. Uh, someone may mention in the chat before, because here is the nexus of archeology span in halacha. Uh, the generally assumed halacha is that the kedusha of Eretz Yisrael, again, I do not want to get into the whole sugya, I don't have to get through all the Gemaras, uh, but basically our rule of thumb is the Kedusha of Eretz Yisrael today is based upon the Kedusha that existed during Bayit Sheni, uh, which we call colloquially Kibush Ole Bavel. Uh, Kibush Ole Bavel, historically, and this is interesting, of course, did not have the same expanse as what we would call Kibush Ole Mitzrayim of Kibush Olei Mitzrayim is, of course, the first Beit HaMikdash. And so the, the Kiddusha of, of Kibush Olei Mitzrayim is no longer. The Kiddusha that we have today is Kibush Olei Babel. Um, and again, you can imagine, it's very, very hard to pinpoint where that Kibush was, uh, where, that, where that boundary was. We do have a rich source of Mishnayot, of cities that existed during Bayit Sheni. And like I say, it's the nexus of archaeology and uh, and halacha exactly where those cities were and where those cities and where those cities weren't. 
Uh, so generally, generally, everybody agrees on what we call the Doroma Arava, which is the uh, land around the, the Eilat area. That's pretty much Muskam, that that is uh, considered to be Kibush Ole Mitzrayim, not Kibush Ole Bavel. There's no Kedushat Eretz Yisrael. The areas around what's called Otef Aza and the areas around a little bit south of Be'er Sheva are subject to some sort of discussion. So again, if you go shopping, here you have Shemitah Yisraelit, Atav Shem Pebet, Tzotzeret Migvulot Ole Mitzrayim, Apip Sikat HaRabonot HaRashut Yisrael, that comes from that part of Eretz Yisrael, which at least according to the Rabbanut is considered to be Ole Mitzrayim. And then you have this other um, package of Shamir, which is Dil, so because he had a different cheshbon of what was considered gvulot ole mitzrayim. So this shamir probably comes from the Doroma Arava, which is more muskam that was gvul ole mitzrayim. And again, you see this, this is packaging. You come, I know my, my granddaughter is here, and Rabbi Shaiwitz's daughter is here for the year, and they come into Osher, I like Nivalim, you know, what am I looking at? You know, where am I going? And again, so you just have to know a little bit about Shemitah and to, to make your way. Uh, the other thing which was mentioned was which, uh, vertical farming, uh, which here is not, again, when the, when the poskim and, and those people to write about what will Shemitah look like in the future? Uh, will Shemitah, how will Medina Yisrael function when Shemitah is Doraita, this is the ultimate pizzaron, which is the Matzah Imenu Takim, which is the hydroponics, which is now served, turned into the vertical, vertical farming. Uh, again, vertical farming, even though Rabbi Albo has introduced it as the magic uh, potion, if you go ahead and you do some, there's a lot of machloket about it, how good it really is. But save it to say, it's things that are grown indoors, matzim, planters, minutakim, that are separated from the grounds, and therefore can be grown any place in Eretz Yisrael, as long as it's indoors, and this can serve for vegetables. It does not, to the best of my knowledge, it does not exist for fruit. It only exists, it only exists for, uh, for, for vegetables. And again, so you come in, read your label, and so this is another another pizza. So the all in here just gidul hydrophony, which is uh, I guess hydroponics in Hebrew. I guess apparently is hydrophony. Uh, so this is another way of bringing all sorts of things to the shock. Uh, but in all these uh, different picture notes, we have left one person out in the cold. And that is the average Israeli farmer. And this is Shammai, who I interviewed, and he'll put it better than I can in terms of the dilemma. And he's a, of the religious farmer here in Eretz Yisrael during Shemitah. Kol am sheyoshev al arzo, tzarich sheyelo haklaot ki ze ech ze lechem ze ha ochel sheanachnu ochlim. ואם אנחנו נשבות בשמיטה לגמרי, <coughs> למעשה הנוכרים יקחו את, יתפסו את מקומנו. על אחת כמה וכמה, החקלאים שמייצאים לחוץ לארץ, לא יכולים להתנתק שנה מהקונים שלהם בחו"ל. <coughs> אז חייבים uh, למצוא את, ה, את, ה, את, ה, את השילוב. מצד אחד לקיים את המצוות במיד... כמו ש... כמו שהתורה ציוותה עלינו, מצד שני למצוא פתרונות הלכתיים. התורה שלנו היא תורת חיים, וחי בהם. So it's, it's always very interesting to, to throw this out there to students. Okay, what do you do? Uh, how do you handle this? Uh, and see the, what, what solutions they come up. Uh, of course, someone mentioned, okay, we can just support the farmers to some, to some extent. The question, is that really viable? Is that, is that financially viable to, 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 uh, to uh, root our stock of dollars uh, to supporting, uh, again, if the stock of dollars are going to farmers during Shemitah, they're not going someplace else. And uh, we're, we're the desperately needed, desperately needed as well. So while on the one hand, you can say, wow, this is great, we're pouring millions of dollars into that. Uh, we have many people that are below the poverty line and uh, living in squalor and improper housing. 
and all sorts of other things. And one could, could and maybe should imagine these same millions of dollars being poured into that before supporting farmers keeping shbita if there are viable alternatives. Uh, so it's not just a simple thing that, okay, we're going to start writing you know, checks. Uh, perhaps a visceral response in America is write checks. Uh, I, I don't know if that's really sustainable in a lot of a lot of different ways, from an ethical point of view and from a practical point of view. Zach, I see your rate. Yeah. yeah, I had a question. Um, uh, what, do you, from an economic point of view, do you know what uh, proportion of the economy is agricultural? Because obviously- 3%, you, 3%. Right, and is that is that decreasing? Because I'd imagine, you know, the yes, more- Yes, 3%, if you, if you read the news over here, right. you know, there was just a whole thing with the budget. Uh, uh, the Sarah Tsar is now, Victor Lieberman, and he, the prices here for fruits and vegetables are sky high, uh, much higher than they are in any, any place else in America or in Europe. And obviously fruits and vegetables is more BCC for the average Israeli household. And in an effort to go ahead and to bring down the prices, one of the things Lieberman wanted to do was to take away the taxes on imports from various vegetables to bring the, bring the prices down. Because again, the uh, certainly one theory is that the farmers are, are just taking advantage of the situation and there's too many middlemen, et cetera. We have to increase more competition. Uh, if there's more competition, prices prices will come down at least, at least in theory. I'm not an economist, I'm not gonna, but, and the chaklaim went crazy. And then they had the whole question over here is how much, do we need chaklaot? We're out of the era of Jaffa oranges. And so what's so the oranges will come from Greece. The oranges will come from Turkey. And they won't, they won't have dry for oranges and they won't be, you know, there was, there was, you know, there's a soft spot in the Israeli heart and in every Jew's heart, you know, for the Chakla'i of 1920 and draining the swamps and, you know, and, and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, they talk about the Nitziv, uh, getting the Hetrog from Hertz Israel and, you know, in Russia, and they're going crazy. Wow, this is unbelievable. Uh, and so there's a soft spot, but it, the econo- do the economics of it really demand it? And on the other hand, we know from our precarious security situation, you don't want to find yourself in a situation where you're totally on your food. You know, you want to be able to be able to feed your own population, at least some, at least dry for oranges, if nothing else. And so you have this tug of war going on within the um, economic sector, nothing to do with Shemitah, as how important is agriculture to Medina Israel 2021. And that's a whole nother, whole nother question. Right. And, and, that. Save it to say that thing was taken out. Uh, Libra right. lost on that. And they're not going to allow the imports to come in. And, and just a continuation of that question. If, if Israel finds, you know, especially, you know, as high tech becomes more and more important and agriculture becomes less important, which is normal for any first world country, um, you know, how is that going to play into the relevancy of Shemitah? Well, you're still going to, ha- it, it, it will become, again, more Chutz La'aretz things and more, more irrelevant in in a, in a certain sort of way, absolutely. Again, you're coming everything but Kotzar. It's again, but it's but as I said, the, there is still a relevance to Shemitah, which I think which is important in terms of your gardens, in terms of out there in the public sector. It's never going to become irrelevant, uh, totally. Uh, it may be that you know by the time it comes to Araita, we're beginning 99 percent of our stuff Now you, uh, there is a Gemara. Um, they were shy was where where it is about that they were not Makadesh Beit Sha'an uh, during Bayit Sheni in order to have a source of things coming from you know from Ki'ilu from Chazaretz. They were aware of it early on that they needed these other sources of uh, uh, of produce uh, during Shemitah if everything everything's going to be Mushpat. But that's a whole nother discussion for another time. So uh, despite the discussion beforehand so- about the, the Karen Shviya, I am uh, I, I I personally don't like it. I don't think it's sustainable. I don't know if it's good use of stucker dollars. Uh, I can imagine stucker dollars again. I know it wouldn't go, but there there are people living in squalor, people all sorts of different uh, uh, different Torah institutions, other institutions that are need stucker dollars. I don't know whether it should be flowing into Shemitah farmers or not. Uh, it's a Siman She'ela. In an uh, ethical, moral, if there are other ways about it. And there may be other ways about it. So it was mentioned was Heta Mechira. 
Uh, you may be aware that uh, even though it had its oranges in the 1600s amongst the Sephardic poskim, we really came to bear is when we came back to Eretz Yisrael in an organized fashion, Baron Edmund de Rothschild goes ahead and he uh, establishes a yeshuv, what basically became today's Masker Bacha. Bacha was uh, Baron de Rothschild's mother, and therefore he renamed it when she died, Masker Bacha. It was uh, originally at Koron, it's right near Rechovot, and uh, comes to Shemitah of Tzermat, he brings over uh, religious farmers. Uh, he, he trains them in farming, they start a yeshuv, and they come to 1888, and these religious farmers want to keep Shemitah, Camp Terry to Shai, want to keep Shemitah. Baron Rothschild said, yeah, out of your mind, keep Shemitah, you're going to go broke. And so it came to a head, and the idea was floated of selling the lands, a similar to Mechirat Chametz, and that, again, it's interesting to talk about the differences between Mechirat Chametz and the Mechirat Kar- Karkaot, but it is often, often referenced as a Ke'ilu Makar. And uh, this uh, might have been the scene uh, uh, in 1888. You can imagine, this is a reenactment, obviously. המושבה פורחת. התוכנית של הרב מואליבר להביא לארץ יהודים אשר יודעים את עבודת האדמה הייתה מוצלחת. המושבה מתבססת ובעוד שנים ספורות לא יזדקקו עוד לעזרת הברון. וידבר אדוני אל משה בהר סיני לאמור. דבר אל בני ישראל ואמרת עליהם כי תבואו אל הארץ אשר אני נותן לכם ושבת הארץ. על כן להצלת נפשותינו ולהצלת יישוב ארצנו הקדושה, מצאנו היתר לשנה הזו התרמ"ט, למכור בקיץ הבא עלינו לטובה את השדות ואת הכרמים. על היתר חתומים הרב טרומפ מקוטנה, הרב קלפיש מוורשה, הרב שמואל מוהליבר, ופוסק גדול הרב יצחק, יצחק אלחנן ספקטור מקובנה. אם כך הבעיה נפתרה. לא בדיוק. ראשי העדה האשכנזית בירושלים מזדעזעים ומפרסמים הודעה. אין שום היתר לחרוש ולזרוע, לקצור ולנטוע, הן על ידי עצמו והן על ידי נוכרי. ואנחנו כולנו סמוכים ובטוחים כי שביתת הארץ תהיה לכם לברכה. ולמותר ייחשב להודיע לכם חומר עונש עוון חילול השמיטה, ושכר השומרה כהלכתה. על החתום הרב יהושע לי דיסקין שליטה והרב שמואל סלנט שליטה. So this machloket starts in 1888 and we are 133 years later and it still rages today. Uh, and uh, of course, Rav Yisrael Khan Inspector gave his chatima, but to that year only. But yet it's been renewed every seven years by the Rabbanut. Uh, this is the picture of the tekes, which took place at the end of August, which was organized by the Rabbanut. Um, and it was sold, the name of the fellow that was sold to this year is Wesley Schmidt. I'm not sure exactly which one he is. I think it's in the checkered shirt. Wesley Schmidt, interestingly enough, lives here in Eretz Yisrael. You can tell by his name, he's not exactly, uh, it's not exactly Goldberg or Schwartz. Uh, he's a non-Jew. Uh, he is Shomer Zayim Mesop Bnei Noach. Um, and uh, that is done purposely to avoid one of the contentions of the Los Chanem, of, uh, of the Chazonish. So they have, they have spiffied up the, 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 the Tekas Mechira Karkaot to try to cover all the loose ends that the Chazonish was upset about. Uh, in terms of, the, the, again, I don't want to go through everything that they do, but most importantly is that it's officially registered on what's called here the Tabu. Uh, one of the big ta- note was, this, this is fake. You know, anything, you go ahead and you sell a house here, it's got to be registered, like in Tinec or wherever you are, it has to be in the municipality, it has to be written down. So here, here it is. It's, it's, it's done very, very officially, because usually when you sell land, all sorts of taxes, so there's a law on the, and that's great, there's a law in Israel, but this is Pator Mimas. It's Pator from taxes, and so they try really to do it, that it should be Chadat Uchadin, that should be a real, 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 a real mechira. This is the, the contract from seven years ago. I can't get the, the current one. Uh, seven years ago, it was 125 billion shekel was the, was the price. 
uh, for the lands, the various karkaot, the farmers that wanted to sell. Real estate is way up, so I assume it's a lot more this time around, but I don't know the exact, the exact amount. And again, you go to the store and you see in big bright letters, Bichata Ars Lamahadrin, Hetzer Mechira. And uh, the corner here says, Yavu Yisrael, supporting the Israeli economy, Akol, Akol Tov. And this is how the vast, vast, vast majority of farmers, there's no downside to the farmers signing on, off to this. No matter who I am, and to go around from farmer to farmer, why not? Uh, you know, even if I'm Chiloni, it doesn't hurt me, you know, only helps me in terms of the markets. And therefore, that's the vast margin, majority, the sets of Mechira. And again, to that share our, uh, our, our mark, Tzachet, Mechira, etc. The Chazon Ish, uh, whose yard site was just Tzvav Mar uh, the Chazon Ish was virulently against that to Mechira. He had a whole laundry list of different complaints about it. I think at the end of the day, uh, if you ask me, his major complaint is that it's not going to be Shemitah. Whereas when you sell your chametz, there's still very much Pesach. When you sell the, 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 the lands, people, even though the worst are certain restrictions, most of the people that sell their farms are not abiding by those restrictions. They're just going ahead and just farming as, as usual. And again, so this, the status would be Sfichin, as we said before, things that are planted during Shemitah are Asur Ba'achila. And therefore, and therefore, you do have a good section of the community and the Haredi community totally unaccepting of the Hetzim Mechira. The other possible way of helping the Israeli farmer, and Rav uh, Shai would describe this, I'll try to describe it a little bit more, Lema'ase, is Otsar Beitin. Otsar Beitin is effectively like this, is that you have farmers that are ready to make their fields have care. And you have the peppers in the field, you have the cucumbers in the field, whatever are in the fields, which are have care. And in theory, what would happen uh, in a Shemitah society, I would go, I would go pick the peppers in the morning and I'm allowed to take for that day. So I pick four peppers and come home and that would be the way Shemitah would work. Lemaisa, I live in Yushalayim. I don't know where the pepper farm is. And I, I'm, no one's driving to the pepper farms to get it. So if this farmer is going to make his field have care, essentially it's going to rot. Uh, so therefore, a Beidin is formed, which is not a, is not a court of law, just a, uh, it's, just a, it's just an official body that represents the public. And they basically say to this farmer, and they say, listen, you're making your field have care. Your stuff is going to rot. There are people in Yushalaya that would die for this stuff because this stuff is real. Shemitah, there's a misfad la'achla. Uh, just can't get it to them. So we represent them. And essentially what we want you to do is we want you to cut a uh, pepper for cone, a, cut, a pepper for Goldberg, cut pepper for Schwartz. Now, so go ahead and harvest your peppers, but uh, they're all have care, but you're doing it for the good people, good people in Yushalayim. We will pay you for your time. We will pay you for your work so that the farmer is making some sort of money. He's not being paid necessarily for the kamut uh, or for the echut, for the quality of the fruits or for how much he does, but he's being paid an hourly wage or whatever the, the arrangement is uh, for his work. He also is responsible to get the, for the for the tr transportation, to get a, a truck uh, to, to wherever it is. And then you come to points, and this is not in the supermarket. You very rarely find it in the supermarket. Uh, I have this store here. Those of you may know, Derek Beit Lachan, there's a Tati guy that has a fruit and vegetable store, the highest prices in the country, but his stuff is excellent. And he has a separate part of the store, which is dedicated to Otsar Beitin. So if I choose, I can go. And here with the Papalim, Beitin, it's 860 a kilo, which is a set price. Um, and I cannot go into the economics of it. It's pretty much the same as a regular Papalim, even though in essence, uh, the, you're not paying for the pepper, but the, since it's very small as compared to other operations and everything else, the prices are high, and so you're not getting a bargain. So, so to speak, for Osar Beitin, what you are getting is a genuine uh, Shemitah fruit. So these are the Agvaniyot. This is what you're going to find later on after Pesach. You're going to find a lot of fruits that are, are Osar Beitin, a lot, a lot of fruits of Osar Beitin. And the thing is very much, when you have Shemitah things in your house, you got to be aware of it uh, because I'm sure a lot of you, and let me just turn off my, uh, my shtick over here. Right? Let me just go to my virtual background so you can see this clearly. Um, and as you are aware, 
and this is an amazing thing, going back to our first theme of Kedushat Eretz Yisrael. It's such Kedushat Eretz Yisrael that the cucumber has a halacha like a page of the Sidur. In the same way, and the kids can relate to it in that way. The same way as a page of the Sidur, if you found it on the floor, no one crumble up and throw it in the garbage. You put it in Kenizah, you put it in Shemot. So you have a cucumber, and you're finished with it. And I think I, I ate one a couple of days ago. So I have it in here. This is ready to be thrown out already. It's here. So you don't put it in the garbage can. You put it in the plastic, and you put it in the Pach Shviyitz, or the Mechal Shviyitz, whatever you want to call it, until it is no good. Other people will just double wrap it and put it in the garbage, which is a form of doing the same thing. Um, with the idea very, very much that you feel, and this is how you feel the Kedushat Shviyat. This is how I feel Kedushat Eretz Yisrael. I feel it when I go outside and look at my yard. I feel it when I, when I see the traffic circles. You feel it when you go to the store. You're feeling Kedushat Eretz Yisrael in a very, very, very real fashion. And that, that's the message. Is that the Sat Kedushat? And you have to be aware of that if you're in New York also, you have to be aware of the Kedushat, of the Kedushat Eretz Yisrael. How to teach Kedushat Eretz Yisrael is another sun up for another time. I certainly have ideas about it, but uh, I'm, I'm overstepping my boundaries right now. So I just want to finish. So, but I have a lot of ideas how to teach Kedushat Eretz Yisrael. So here, this is uh, a great, uh, great picture. So you have potato chips, and you have on the, the right hand side, you have the potatoes, Yuvul Mikhul. These are coming from Chutz Aris. The potatoes are from Poland. Therefore, it enjoys Ashkacha Deida Hacharedit. On the left hand side, you see it's marked Apiatu Mechira. And therefore, the Ashkacha Deida Hacharedit is nowhere, is nowhere, is nowhere to be found. Just to finish off, this is Ged Yossi Peretz speaking about his interaction with Shemitah. <laughs> כרגע שאני עוצר, יושב ומפנה את עצמי לדברים אחרים, יותר ללמוד, יותר לדאוג לעצמי שזה הרבה דברים שאני מזניח שאין לי שנת השמיטה. חוץ מזה שזה מחזיק אותי מבחינה אמונית, ואני מאמין שכל מה שהקב"ה הוא נותן לנו זה שלו. העצים, הכל, אם זה שנת השמיטה או לא שנת השמיטה, אנחנו צריכים לעשות בדיוק מה שהציבה אותנו, ואנחנו עושים, וכשמאמינים עד הסוף הכל מסתדר. אני לא, לא, אנחנו לא מודאגים. לא מודאגים בעניין הזה. וזה טוב, אתה צריך גם לפעמים לנוח, להפסיק שנה אחת, יש לך לשבת, ללמוד, ברוגע, לא בלחץ, הכל בסדר, הכל יסתדר, יש מי שדואג, והכל, ואנחנו לא צריכים לדאוג בדברים האלה. אני מרגיש שיש לי השגחה פרטית, בורא עולם תמיד שומר עלינו. כשאנחנו מקיימים את השמיטה, תמיד אחרי השמיטה, בורא עולם, לא רוצה, לה... בורא עולם לא חייב לנו כלום, אבל בדרך כלל, לפני ואחרי, בורא עולם דואג לנו. ויש לנו פרנסה גם לעוד שנה ולעוד שנתיים, ואנחנו מרגישים בסדר עם זה. אנחנו לא... אני לא חושב שאנחנו מקופחים. עכשיו, אנחנו, אנחנו מרגישים ממש בזה. לא יודע, לא היה לי כל מיני סיפורים כמו שיש לאנשים, אבל אני יכול להגיד לך שתמיד אחרי השמיטה, לא יודע איך זה, יש פירות יפים מאוד אחרי השמיטה. Okay, so so the Darom Golan is part of uh, Kedushat Eretz Yisrael. Where the dividing line is, is very, very hard to mark. So generally speaking, the Golan is considered in terms of Shemitah, in terms of Kedushat Eretz Yisrael. Okay, any other questions or comments? I'd be happy to field them at this point. Mr. Cohen? Yes, what, please. What's the, from the perspective of a farmer, how much does a farmer lose out if, if he decides to go with Otsar Beitin? The, okay, this guy, that guy, Shammai, a lot of problems with Otsar Beitin. A lot, a lot of problems. The biggest problem is that the Haredi community doesn't do it. And so as a result, you, see, you take the, who's interested in Otsar Beitin? In other words, people that you know, want to eat Shemitah and everything else. The Haredi community, for one reason or another, doesn't, doesn't do it. I don't know. I can't, I can't go there. Exactly why they don't. Um, and therefore, as a result, the, the, the a very a small purchasing base for it. And therefore the farmers can, they tend in the past, there's been a lot of lost money uh, going from Otsar Beitin. One of the big champions of Otsar Beitin, for those of you who are familiar with the people is Rav Vitman, who is the Rav Tenuva, who lives on Alon Shvot. So if you go ahead online, again, if you go back to Leshmita, Otsar Beitin, Otsar Beitin, Rav Riman also is a big champion of Otsar Beitin. Rav Litman, at least this year, 
uh, as of two months ago, put out a letter. I'm out. It's not fair to the farmers. They're not. They're not really getting the money. We're not able. To, we don't have the money to pay them uh, because we don't have the customer base. What they tried to do this year, and I assume it's happening, is they tried to get a big customer. And that was Sal. That Sal was supposed to be a customer of Otsar Beitin this year. And obviously, that's one of the biggest customers in the country, if not the biggest customer in the country, which is supposed to give it a little bit more, give a little bit more traction. Uh, again, there was an article in the, in the paper uh, here. Was it uh, two Shabbatot, two Shabbatot ago? You know, the, um, uh, you always hear about Sivan Rachav Meir. Of course, her husband's Yidzijam Meir. And he also comes along for the ride. So he wrote, you know, the typical thing that, that, that somebody came back from yeshiva, the mir for a whole year after Shemitah. I didn't even know a Shemitah. You know, that, that sort of thing. And he said, that's horrible. Because what are they doing? Everything's coming chutzaretz and no one feels anything. And so that's really, you know, taking an end run to, around Shemitah. And uh, I think it's just such an opportunity, both in terms of me and everybody, of, of learning and feeling this idea of Kedushat Eretz Yisrael. Yes, Rabbi Avo. Um, so first of all, thank you for your entire presentation. But I, I wanted My to pleasure. ask, is, thank you. Um, is there anywhere a discussion of the idea of um, like animal rights from the perspective of back in the day when you used to harvest with animals and so on and so forth, the year of Shemitah clearly created a whole year where animals were working weren't working as hard. Um, is that at all a conversation? I, I can't even think of sources for it, but is yeah. maybe, uh, not, you know. not not in my circles. I haven't, you know, I haven't heard it. Obviously, it's not it doesn't affect anybody in modernity, but uh I, I don't right. know such a discussion, but it doesn't mean it's not there. Right. In other words, is it like a Shabbat for my animals? Just like on Shabbat, my animal doesn't work one day a week. That, that's, a, that's a that's a very beautiful idea that I never you know thought of before. Okay. Uh, because obviously, you know, no one's using animals anymore, at least in the Jewish sector. Right. Also, and the, then, on the way out to, to, to Gush, you still see, you see it on the side of the road somehow that they're still using those animals, but, uh, but not in the Jewish sector. And then it's the second question we keep thinking about when we talk about um, Heter Mechira, when you, when you talk about Yivul Chol, and so, so is there perhaps maybe 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 the Torah was you know knowing that you're going to need to import fruits from outside and things of that sort? Is there a possibility that included in the concept of Shemitah is almost like Mishum Eva, you know, to or, or Mipnei Shalom? In other words, I don't think it's Mishum Eva. I, I agree with you totally. I think, in other words, loopholes. The two types of loopholes. There are loopholes where lechatchila. If you talk about government bills and things like that, constant tax loopholes or whatever. There are loopholes that are put there by Kavana. And there are loopholes that some like CPA somehow, you know, discovers along the way, and then they spend years trying to trying to trying to fill up. These loopholes that the Hetz Michael Dati, in my opinion. And that in other words, in the Prusbal, the whole idea of Prusbal is not why Hill to Camp is for Machshavatchila. There was a feeling that it would be very, very difficult. This is something, and, and, and you do have, I think, uh, just go to, to every time it says Motzamud in the Torah. Motzumat, 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 Motzumat. You learn the Mishnah Mako, never, never happens. What's, what's going on? Because the Torah Shabbat is giving us a blueprint of perfection. The Torah Shabbat is giving us Tachlis, what's going to work now. Tachlis is going to work. And I think there's a Shemitah of perfection, which I think is important to know. The same way it's important to know that if you're Mechala Shabbat, and that, 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 that you know, it, it, again, but no Beitin in the whole wide world, you know, and we all know it, ever killed anybody for Chidul Shabbat except the Makosh And uh, I don't know how long, uh, how often Malkot were given a Beitin. I don't know. No, Mitzah, we know from the mission of Malkot. Malkot, I don't know, it was every day with the flogging people. Somehow, I don't think that happened. So you finish with a dot and everything else. I don't think I don't think that happened. It's all there to tell you. You know, this is serious stuff. Take it, take it, take it seriously. But it's built into the system. It's built into the system that should never happen. So here also, I think there's again what we're doing here. I don't view the heads of Mikira as some sort of loophole, and you know that Hakadosh Baruch didn't think of that one. Oh, you know we're we're at Smarty, we're at Smarty the Borei Alam. You know he never thought of that. We got heads of Mikira. You know, we, and we're gonna we're gonna do it. That's not the way I view it at all whatsoever. 
I think it's there, built into the built in very, very much to the system. It's Prisbo was built into the, to the system. I don't know if they're from people around. I'm sure there's some people like this that before before uh, before Shmita, at the end of Shmita, they're going to give a loan to somebody. Ah, and I'm not going to write a Prisbo and I'm not going to collect the loan because I, you know, I don't think you're supposed to. And if you give me such a loan, it's going to be for five bucks. No one's giving a loan of a million dollars for that. That I assure you. He's not kissing goodbye to us a million dollars. So five dollars, maybe. It'll be for him for five dollars, but not for a million dollars. Uh, because I think it's built into the hardware of, this, of the system that, okay, you know, we're, we're, going, to, we're going to have a, a thriving economy. And that, that this is a way that you can go ahead and keep it while still knowing, in theory, what the Torah wants us to do even though practically it may not be able to play it out right now, right now in, in that particular way. Yes, Rabbi Schwartz. Um, this rabbi who was interviewed about, um, made his, his um, Etrog field half um, was there for a lot, do you know like economically what happened to him or other people like him who, who opt in with the, let's hold yeah, it completely? Yeah, that's, that's easy. He, has, he has a thriving, how did I get to my, my son? My youngest son was in the business for a while. Now, now he's doing another job. He was in the etrog business. So he mm. set me up with this guy to go. Mm. He sells, I think, 40,000 etrog him. Right. He's, he's not selling five etrog him a year. 40,000, 40,000 etrog him. But he has another job. It's not mm. all he does. He's not on, He's actually a mechanic and himmelfarb. For those of you that may know, the himmelfarb is one of the Tatsilumi uh, 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 schools in Bayt Fagan. He, so he has another ki'ilu source of income. But, mm-hmm. but this is also, I mean, he, he's mashki on this. Mm-hmm. So does it earn there are other people that, that, that it's obviously harder, but like anything else and like in any other business that you do, which is somewhat seasonal, always uh, reminds me about Harrow's. I think Harrow's is in the swimming pool business and they're in the kitchen, in their Christmas decoration business. Because when they're doing swimming pools, they do, so when you, when, you, when you get into this business as, as a, from farming, you know, so you know that you have to develop other other ways of doing things. You know, it's not a surprise. And uh, again, you know, I, I, again, people deserve our support. Uh, I, I think it is again a wide open question. You know, with the limited stock of dollar, is is this where it should go? And I think that people have to develop other other sources of incomes and you do tours and you do this and you do that, all sorts of different things that people do in order to, you know, fill, fill in, fill in the holes. I mean,